Hey friends and family and fans of Biblical Genetics, on this episode we are going to be discussing a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about the origin of the Israelite nation. Now, I've written a lot about the Jewish nation over the years. Just last week I had an article that appeared on creation.com titled The Forging of the Israelite Nation. Next week I'm going to have another article on creation.com about how long the Israelites were in Egypt using their genealogy to try to figure it out. I'm actually going to have a biblical genetics episode about that coming up very soon, but just stay tuned for that one. I wrote another article about the genetic history of the Israelite nation. Another article that I wrote several years ago, which is now on creation.com, is titled Extensive Mixing Among Israelites and Non-Israelites in Biblical History. Essentially, I just went through the Bible and looked for every example I could find, I know I missed a couple, but every example I could find of an Israelite that married a non-Israelite that's recorded in the Bible, and I was shocked. I mean, before I wrote that article, I could have named a couple. Ruth, Rahab, a few more. But I uncovered dozens, if not hundreds, of pairings between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. So in the end, the Jews are a Middle Eastern people but there's nothing amongst them to distinguish them as being specifically Jewish in their genetics. Ooh, it's a fascinating topic. We will revisit that in the future. Now, one reason why the Jews are such a fascinating people is they have a history unlike anybody else. We have a record of where they came from. This man named Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. And so we have the word Israel, Israelite, Israeli. This all comes from Jacob's new name. Israel and the Israelite people are fascinating. We have who they came from, who they're related to, who married whom in their early history. We have all this time in the history of, of the Jewish uh, people in the time of the kings of Israel and Judah. We have the Babylonian dispersion, the return to the land, then the, the Roman conquest and the Roman destruction of the temple, and then the, the Jewish people spreading out in, in Europe and in Africa and in uh, Central Asia, they are really amazing. I don't know any other example that we have such detailed history of people, especially their founding history. They claim to come from one man who had four wives, and that man had 12 sons amongst those four wives, and a couple of daughters, one of whom was named Dinah, but there are several daughters in there also. That's interesting in itself. But what I did was I went through the scriptures as best I could, and I built a family tree of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 founding patriarchs of Israel, the 12 tribes, are all descendants or sons of Jacob. If we start off with Adam, we could build a family tree. We could start off with Noah. We could go through Eber. We could go through Shem. We could go through Terah. Where do we start? Oh, what are all these names? These are all names that are listed in Genesis chapter 11. If you take all these names and put them together, you have Noah, the founder of the post-flood human race. We have Shem, the, one of the sons of Noah, from whom we get the word Semitic. We have an important patriarch named Eber, from whom we get the word Hebrew. Then we have, along down the line, someone named Terah, that's Abraham's father. Then we have Isaac, then we have Jacob, who is renamed Israel. Later on, one of Jacob's sons, Judah, is going to give rise to the name Jew. So now we have Jew, Hebrew, and Semitic. This is where these words come from, from the names in the Bible. Very, very interesting. But let's just start with Terah. Because from Terah, we have a family tree that branches out to four children of his that all come back together again for the 12 tribes of Israel. He is Abraham's father. He is also the father of Abraham's wife, Sarah. You. But they have different mothers. So their step, stepbrother, stepsister, they get married. They have a child named Isaac. They also have, well, Abraham at least, also has Ishmael through his Egyptian servant Hagar. And after Sarah dies, he has a bunch of sons with a woman named Keturah that we don't know anything about. But just looking at the central line that goes to the Israelites, we go Abraham and Sarah come from Terah. They have Isaac. Then Isaac marries Rebecca. Now, Rebecca is descended from both of Abraham and Sarah's brothers, Nahor and Haran. Nahor marries his niece Milcah, who is his brother's daughter. Haran gave birth to Milcah. Nahor, the brother, marries Milcah. They have Bethuel. Bethuel marries someone we don't know. 
but he has two children, at least Rebecca and Laban. Rebecca marries Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca have Jacob, but then Jacob marries the children of Laban. He marries Rachel and Leah, his first cousins. Except they're much closer than first cousins because he's related to them along multiple lines. So Rachel and Leah are Jacob's wives. Bilhah and Zilpah are Jacob's concubines. We don't know what their ancestry is. They could easily have been descended from Terah, at least some way. We don't know. But in the end, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. So if you look at all the sons, Leah gives birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Rachel, the favorite wife, gives birth to Joseph, the favorite son, and then Benjamin. Bilhah gives birth to Dan and Naphtali, and Zilpah gives birth to Gad and Asher. Now here's where it gets interesting. You know that you're 50% of your father and 50% of your mother. You should, you should know that. You got half your genome from mom and half from dad. Well, that means you're 25% equal to your grandparents, 12.5% equal to your great-grandparents, about 6% to your great-great-grandparents, and so on. So the percentage you are related to each ancestor as you go back in time goes down by half. Okay. Well, if you look at this family tree, by the time you get to the 12 tribes of Israel, if you follow the longest line that we know of going up to Terah, those brothers should be about 3% similar to Terah. But they're not because they inherited Terah's DNA in multiple different lines. So if you go Terah, Abram, Isaac, Jacob to the 12 sons, well, they would have inherited about 6.25% of their DNA from Terah. That happens also through Sarah. But if you go through Nahor, the sons are only going to inherit about 3% of Terah's DNA. If you go through Haran, they're going to inherit about 1.5% of Terah's DNA. Then you can go through Nahor to Bethul, to Laban to Rachel, Nahor to Bethul to Laban to Leah. You can go from Terah to Haran to Milcah to Bethul to Laban to Rachel, or Terah to Haran to Milcah to Bethul to Laban to Leah. And that's also about 1.5%. So if you add all those percents up, you come to a shocking realization. Instead of being 6% or 3% or 1.5% identical to Terah, all added up, the brothers are about 22%. That's almost like grandchildren instead of great, great, whatever grandchildren. And because of the laws of genetics, there are going to be some sections of the 22% that are identical. In other words, all of the brothers got exactly the same piece of DNA from the mother and the father, which is probably going to be about half. So about 10% of their genomes is completely homogenous. No genetic diversity in about 10% of their genomes. That's pretty shocking. Almost none of you listening to this have that level of what are called runs of homozygosity. Long stretches where there's no genetic difference because you got the same exact piece of DNA from your mother and your father. Very few people in the world today have something like that, but they would have. So if that section of DNA, that 10% of their genome about, carried something that affected the color of the hair or the skin or the eyes, the shape of the nose, the curliness of the hair, height, weight, anything, you could be walking down the streets of some ancient village and go, oh, oh, there's an Israelite right there. But interestingly, you could probably do that in just about any village in any ancient setting because most people throughout history have married someone closely related who was born maybe a couple of miles away from where they were born. And sure enough, the day after I recorded this episode, a brand new paper came out in Nature Communications from Ringbauer et al. I will have a link in the show notes. This is fascinating. They looked at runs of homozygosity in ancient people. The problem is ancient DNA is riddled with gaps. It tend to be very short pieces of DNA that they pick up. And a lot of times you won't get both copies of the genome in an ancient individual. But what they reasoned is if you have a whole bunch of little pieces in a row, even if they're disconnected, if they all match one particular piece of DNA that's floating around in the modern population, well, that probably means that that individual only has one copy of that piece. In other words, both the mother and the father gave them identical copy. They did provide one graphic of the most inbred individual that they found, which just happens to be an ancient individual from Israel. And looking at the different relatednesses, this person is probably a full sibling match. In other words, the parents were brother and sister. 
or it's an aunt nephew or something like that. You, you can't necessarily exactly know because there's probabilities you have to apply to this. All we know is that this person was very inbred and the parents of this person were very closely related. However, this paper contradicts what I just said. Their conclusion is that in ancient history, most people did not marry someone closely related. You don't have lots and lots of cousin marriages. Now today, maybe 10% of world marriages are cousin marriages, especially in certain uh, religious communities, shall we say. But by and large, in ancient times, people didn't marry close kin, especially when the population sizes started growing with the advent of intensive agriculture. Before that, in the hunter-gatherer days, people were more likely to marry someone closely related. Later on, with larger population sizes, it was less likely. Very interesting, fascinating, amazing. I can't believe they're able to do this, but just understand that this is a statistical approach. It's not perfect. There's some ambiguity here, but the data do seem to be pointing in a new direction. Science has just learned something, and I just learned something. So it's not just the Israelites. Basically, in every little village, in everywhere across the world, people are going to probably be marrying people from their same village, maybe the village next door, but not someone from thousands of miles away. That's not how humans have behaved in history. So we get this recipe that inbreeding leads to genetic distinction. Inbreeding leads to the origin of specific characters that you can set to within a specific group of people. Inbreeding leads to the origin of races. Yeah, it's the inbreeding that occurred as the population split at Babel and broke up into a whole bunch of little subpopulations and migrated across the world. Each of those subpopulations is going to be inbreeding within themselves only over time, giving rise to a genetically different little subpopulation. Now, some populations merged. Some of the ones that stayed around in the Middle East, they interact with each other a lot more. You have got massive population structure in Africa. You have very little population structure in Europe because these massive waves of migration basically erased genetic Europe and reset it again several times in history. But what we're seeing in the Israelite population is just a mirror of what has happened across the world at large. Inbreeding leads to genetic differentiation. Therefore, inbreeding leads to the origin of races. So if you look at all these people in the family tree, you can see how similar they are to Terah, Abraham, and Sarah. They're both 50% identical. However, so is their son, Isaac. What? Yeah, because they would have inherited half of Terah's genome from each of the parents. 25% from Abraham, 25% from Sarah. That equals 50%. Now, the telomeres aren't necessarily the same size and more mutations would have accumulated in that generational step, but essentially they gave birth to their brother, their half-brother. Yuck! But this is what happens when half-brother and half-sister get married. You go on down the line. Um, Isaac is about 50%. Um, Jacob is about 34.5%. Rebecca is about 18%. Rachel and Leah are about 9%. And then you get to the 12 tribes. And depending on if they're descended from Bilha or Zilpah or Rachel or Leah, Rachel and Leah give us about 22% similar to Terah, but Zilpah and Bilha about 17%. That's not accounting for the possibility that they are also descended from Terah. If any one of the unknown people in the family tree is also a descendant of Terah, the percent Terah just goes up. And the amount of inbreeding also goes up. So in the end, we can conclude that yes, the Jewish people started off with a lot of inbreeding. However, over the next several centuries, as documented in the Bible, there was a lot of outbreeding. They're not currently an inbred population. They started off in the same way that a lot of other people groups in the world started off with, marrying amongst close relatives only. It's not necessarily true of all families because, especially today, we have a lot of uh, mixed race, we call them families, even though I don't like the term race. But mixed race is something we talk about a lot in our culture, so it's not really racist to say mixed race. Hmm, is it? I don't know. You can answer that comment below if you like. Well, that was an overly brief description of the early generations leading up to the founding of the nation of Israel. If you enjoyed that, comment below or go to creation.com and read the original article, Inbreeding the Origin of Races. From there, you can link to all my other articles about Israel that I've written also. We will be covering this more in the future. There's a lot 
more to say. But before I go, I just want to thank all of you for watching. If you're not a subscriber yet, I encourage you, please subscribe to my video channel, or if you're listening on podcast, to the podcast, and if you're on video, click the bell on, on YouTube, because that'll just give you a notification when my next one comes out, which is already filmed in the can and ready to go. Now, Biblical Genetics gets its support through my very generous donors, and this week I've had several brand new people, Delane H., Adina, Amanda M., Craig C., my old friend, Rob from Smithfield, brand new people who found me on buymeacoffee.com. It's a very simple engine where you can just put a couple dollars in my coffee cup. Uh, but also, Stephanie S., you have donated multiple times, at RS2, John H., George S., and three anonymous donors this month. Now, I do recognize your names, but thank you very much. Over on Patreon.com, my monthly support comes from Dave H., M. Matsky, and Rob S. at the top tier. Mark K., Mike Daniel P, James R, and Jeff VD in that middle tier, Jonathan P, Paul P, Ted H, and a brand new supporter this month, Chris R. Thank you. I also want to give a giant shout out to Ken and Connie for your very generous support over many months. I really appreciate all of you. There's a lot more coming down the pike with biblical genetics. I have got a lot more ideas. This is a lot of fun, I can't believe how many people I'm finding, how many people I'm communicating with, but also how many people are watching my videos. I'm watching my channel grow and grow and grow. And every month I get a little bit more traction, a little bit more exposure. Thank you all. If you're listening on podcasts, do me a favor. Tell someone else about this podcast. Rate it, like it, share it. That's the best thing you can do to help other people find it except by word of mouth. Thank you all. I love you. Stay tuned. I'm coming back next week with another interesting episode.